to live with humans. Fought the enemy as a human. And in the movie Black Panther, had to be buried. And come back from the grave as a king. That's the story of Jesus. It's also the story that they put in Superman also. They put it in a lot of superhero movies. And when we go to watch those stories, we pay a lot of money to watch those but when it comes to reading it in the Bible, the true story, the authentic story, the complete protein, don't read it. We don't pay for it. We think it's too cheap. It's poor. So we have lost our identity. We have lost our identity as Africans. We have lost our identity as wherever you come from. But more important, we have lost our identity as Jews. And last night we were talking about that when you don't know what your identity is, then you don't know what your privilege is. You don't realize how privileged you are. Because you come here and they tell you that you are a nobody. Even though you had a degree back home. Even though you had a business back home. Even though you were a leader back home. They tell you that you were a nobody. And you start to believe it. And when you believe it, you sell yourself cheap. I was comparing us to the word of Apple Corporation. See, Apple just hit one trillion dollars last year. But even that one trillion dollars is not enough to buy one of us. Each one of you is worth more than the worth of Apple Corporation. So, most of the time, we think the other way. We think that we are cheap. So we sell ourselves cheap. Because somebody told us that we are cheap. Somebody told us that we are zero. So we don't eat healthy. Because we do drugs because who cares? We give our bodies away because who cares? Because we don't know how and last night I was sharing a story of, of how I discovered this in my life. I was, I was uh, on a trip to Asia. I went to a wedding of my best friend. 
And when I was going there, it was 13 hours from New Jersey to Beijing. Five hours from Beijing to Manila. Two hours from Manila to another city. And one hour by bus from the city no, no, to no, no, to no, 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 So when I got there, I was exhausted. Yes, and in the hotel room, the, no, 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 actually, it wasn't even a hotel room, it was just like a motel. And, uh, and then, and then, I got there and, and the water was terrible. So of course I start complaining. I started complaining because the water was bad. I started complaining because the trip was long. And, and then of course I'm, I'm complaining because on the on, on, on school, some of the planes there is no Wi-Fi. Okay. Uh, and, and then and then uh, I, I start complaining later at, at that same hotel because I gave them my clothes to wash. And they they messed it up. And they lost. My favorite sweater. Or at least it seemed that like they, they had lost it. So I complained a lot. And they found it. But I went home. Saying this place was horrible. So then I left the Philippines and I went back to Beijing. And so I complained while I was in Beijing. But nobody wanted to speak to me in English. See, I forgot that they have a country of 1.5 billion. And they don't need us. So they don't need to speak our language. Okay. They, they haven't bought into that whole, you know, Europeans are better business. They, 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 they don't believe that the Europeans are better. They didn't do the same thing that we did back home. Of, of trying to learn the, the European languages. I'm not knocking the Europeans. I'm just knocking us for believing those things are better. So there I was in China and I'm complaining that they don't speak to me in English. And I complain about other things too. And yet, I got the opportunity to do so. That billions of people would never get a chance. I got to walk on the Great Wall of China. I got to walk on the Great Wall of China. I got to walk on the Great Wall China. I got to see the Forbidden City. I got to see the Summer Palace. I got a beautiful personalized tour of all of them. So as I sat on the plane back to New Jersey, I was preparing to preach somewhere else the next day. I had a different sermon plan. And God changed my mind right there. He said to me, John, John, don't you realize how privileged you are? You just got to travel to Asia without getting into debt. 
You got to see the Great Wall of China. You got to, to walk and climb the Great Wall of China. Something that more than three, four, five, six billion people would never get to do. You got to be on airplanes safely. You got back home. And then you're complaining. Don't you realize that you have more benefits than 99% of the world? I am one of the 1%. One of the 1%. One of the 1%. And by the way, so are you. Now we can't go and mess it. See, you got here by car today, didn't you? Well, you must have seen that they're more aggressive. And they, it may not be your car, but you got here by car. Right? See, go see. How many of you had to walk three or four miles to get here? There's a lot of people in the world who have to walk ten miles to go to church. In fact, there are some stories I've heard of people who have to leave their home while it is still dark. Walk for half a day to get to church. Have church. And then when they finish with church, they walk another half of the to get back home. And you came by car. Okay. All right. So let, let's see. Uh, for those of you who are, you know, 18 and older, how many are college educated? I just want to see your hand. College educated. Okay, good. All right. That puts you in the one percent. If you give me which the mobile one, he will be Jana, he will be Jana. How many of you have uh, one of these? The man of the day, if you call it, you need to be there. The man, you get it. The man, raise your hand. You know you okay, uh, you are part of the one percent. Now, if you combine those three things, car, or at least availability, college education, computer, or smart device, that makes you super privileged. Which says, I have a good 
good inheritance. I have a good inheritance. So now, when you have a good inheritance, it means you have a good family. And that family was rich. So now we have a good inheritance. Okay, so, and by the way, that family is the family of Jesus Christ. So you belong to the family of the greatest entity in the universe. So now, if, if, if you belong to Jesus, and you have his inheritance, you are very privileged. Now let's find out what to do with that. And we will go to the story that helps us to realize how we change our lives. Luke. Luke, Luke is a very interesting book. Luke is a very interesting book. Before, before we go to the story of the, the, the story is the story of the Good Samaritans. Okay. Uh, but before I go to Luke, I just, I just wrote down some things I wanted to share with you. My pastor friends and my theologian friends, this is the end of our prayer. Uh, I like the book of Luke. I, well, I like the entire Bible. Of course, because my name is John, my favorite used to be the Gospel of John. But now I think Luke is my favorite. Number one, Luke was a researcher. Just like me. You know? And, and he researched this story, right? Those of you that have gone to college and maybe in school you have to do some research. And, and, and Luke, Luke writes two books. The first one we call the Gospel of Luke. The second one we call the Book of Acts. The, the, the Gospel of Luke is a research paper. No, no, no. And in that research paper, he speaks to people just like you and me. That's why I really like the book of Luke. See, Matthew was talking about the kingship of Jesus. No, no. When, when he was talking about the genealogy, he said, you know, there was the son of this one, the son of this one. The, they went through the, 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 the family line of the kings. But when Luke was saying the genealogy of Christ, he used the common folks. So, so, so Luke is talking to somebody like you and me. When Matthew talks about what happened at the birth of Jesus, he speaks about these magi coming to visit Herod. And so whatever was happening at the palace. When Luke speaks about the birth of Jesus, he talks about shepherds. Regular people just like me. Regular people who have day to day problems. Who live paycheck to paycheck. Who, who don't have disposable income. And, and maybe, maybe I'm excluded. Because those people can 
couldn't afford to go to Asia. So I think maybe I'm like in between Luke and Matthew. But but I remember what it was like to be on food stamps. So and and, and when, when Luke talks about people in general, he specifically looks at Jesus' attitude towards the groups that are excluded. No, no, not, not that they, they exclude themselves. But they, they, other people exclude them. People in English, we call them marginalized. Women. Strangers. Jesus, through the Gospel of Luke, shows that he came not just for the men, but also for the women. Thank you, Pastor. I heard the, 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 the Sabbath school you talk about. There's no Greek, there's no Jew, there's no male, there's no so Jesus is talking to us as equals. And Jesus shows that he doesn't care where you come from. All he cares about is that you have a relationship. And then he goes and he blows their mind with the story of the good Samaritan. So, uh, if you go to Luke chapter 10, I'm not going to read the story, you know the story. But, one, some things that I want to emphasize. But then there was also a lot of human 
danger. They were thieves. That's the next key characters in the story. So uh, before we go on, let me ask you, what was the nationality of the thieves? What was the nationality of the thief? Have you ever thought about that? Yeah. Okay. Okay. What country is it in? No, no, I'm talking about this particular road from Jerusalem to Jericho. This was in Judea. Okay, Jerusalem is in Judea, Jericho is in Judea, close to Galilee. Uh, so this was the Jewish country. The people that are locals were Jews. Okay. So, so that's the nationality of the thieves. Okay. Uh, and then there was a priest and a Levite. Okay. Uh, what nationality were they? They were Jews. Okay. The Levite was from the tribe of Levi, but kind of absorbed into the Jewish. They were all called Jewish. Because Judah became the leading tribe and they, they just uh, Okay, so the thieves are Jews. The priest is a Jew and the Levite is a Jew. Okay. Alright. And then there was another person that came and he the, the story tells us that uh, the third person who came was from where? Okay, so the person got beat up is on the side of the road. First comes a priest. And the priest looks at him and goes the other way. Okay. And the Levite comes and he sees them and he walks the other way. And then a third person comes. And the third person, the third person was from where? From where? From Samaria. From Samaria. From Samaria. Yes. All the story of the good Samaritans. He was from Samaria. Samaritans were distant cousins of the Jews. But they had mixed with other nations. To a Jew, a Samaritan was a very unclean person. A, 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 a Jew did not have any business to do with Samaritans. As a matter of fact, when Jews would travel from Galilee to Jerusalem, they would avoid the village of the Samaritans. They would go around the city instead of going through the city. That's why in John chapter 4, it says specifically that Jesus chose to go through the city of Samaria instead of going around the city of Samaria. So, 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 so uh, the Jews and the Samaritans did not mix. Okay, now this is where I'm going to pause. And I'm going to ask for your forgiveness. Because I'm going to hurt your feelings. I'm going to hurt your feelings. And when I do hurt your feelings, I pray. That you understand that I'm not doing it just to be mean. 
When Jesus told this story, yes, he has any to take it as well. He told the story because it was a headline in their news. It was something that had just recently happened. So everybody that was listening to it understood the story immediately. And when Jesus finished saying the story, he asked the lawyer who asked him the question. The lawyer was asking the question, who is my neighbor? And he asked that question because Jesus told him, there's only one way to be saved. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your strength and all your mind. And love your neighbor as yourself. So the lawyer wanted to justify himself. And he says, so who is my neighbor? And Jesus tells him the story. And when he finishes telling him the story, he asked him the question, who was the neighbor to the man that was beaten up? And the man, because he hated Samaritans so much, he couldn't even bring himself to say the name Samaritan. He simply said, the one who died. So let's put ourselves again in this story. The man that was beat up was beat up by his fellow countrymen. He was beat up by people from his church. He was on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. He had been experiencing problems in his faith. Do you see that? Jerusalem represents a faith that is strong. Jerusalem represents an active spiritual life. Jericho represents bad situations in your life spiritually. Jericho represents when you are living in sin. So it happens to all of us that we go from a strong worship experience and because of life situations we allow ourselves to go down in our spirituality. Do you understand where we're going with this? The road from Jerusalem to Jericho is what we call backsliding. And so, what should the church do to somebody who's backsliding? What did Jesus tell them? He said that the church members are the same ones who beat him up while he was backsliding. And then the church leadership the priest and the Levite looked the other way and went the other way. That's a sad situation to be in. It happens especially to our young people. It happens especially to our children. It happens especially, actually it happens to anybody. And some of us stay in the church even though we've been beat up at and left for dead. And leadership has done nothing about it. We were on the road from Jerusalem to Jericho. Yes, we 
who are responsible for our sins. Don't ever blame the church for your sins. But our job as a church, our mission as a church, is to get those people who are backsliding. Help them to go back up. Help them to make it back to a good relationship with Christ. Instead of beating them up, leaving them for dead. Now, the reason why I asked you to forgive me is because each one of us sitting right here is a fear. We are all the thieves. When I used to read this story, I used to think I was a good Samaritan. Number one, I can't be the good Samaritan. Who's the good Samaritan? In the story, who's the good Samaritan? Jesus. Yes. Jesus is the one who comes to find you. Yes, no one When they beat you up. When they left you for dead. When they told you you're nobody. When they told you you couldn't do this. When they told you we don't worship like this. When they told you that we don't say this. When they told you we don't dress like that. When they told you we don't eat like this. Jesus is the one who comes to find you. He's the one who uses his oil. He's the one who uses his oil. He's the one who uses his wine. I wish somebody would understand what I'm talking about. You see, when Jesus at the Last Supper, when he gave them the wine, what did he say it was? He said it was his blood. And it says in the story that the good Samaritan came and used wine. To the wine. wine. To clean the wounds of the broken. He used his blood to cleanse our sins. Are you, are you with me? And in the Bible it says that the oil is the Holy Spirit. And then he said, it says that the Samaritan he used oil to make sure that the wounds would heal. So Jesus uses his blood to cleanse our sins away. And then he uses his Holy Spirit to heal us. I can't be the good okay. I even thought that maybe I was the priest or the Levite. Yes. yes. And yes, they were bad. They were bad. In this situation, they were bad. Because they focused more on structure rather than grace. They focused more on rituals rather than how to bring people to God. See, the priest and the Levite were saved. If I touch this body, which is almost dead or maybe dead, I'm going to turn on. So I need to stay clean. 
Many times, Kenshi, we see somebody in sin, and rather than to minister to them, we think to ourselves, well, if I go join them, then I might become like one of them. Or other people, they look at me and say that I become a sinner. That's not what Jesus did. Jesus ate with sinners all the time. Jesus touched the <laughs> Jesus touched the blind. He walked with everybody in every place. He knew what his mission was. He understood what his mission was. Because he knew who he was. He understood what his privileges were. Um, um, so he had no problem about what others are going to say. What do you know who you are? You don't care what other people are going to say. What do you know what you've got? What you have. You don't care about sharing it. Because you know there's more coming. And therefore, you have no problem going forth and doing it. So, I have five questions. Five questions. Those five questions are Who am I? That's the first question you have to ask yourself when, when you try to establish your purpose. God puts you here for a purpose. There is no oops in God. Do you understand? God does not make mistakes. God does not make mistakes. Let me tell you, even if your parents made a mistake, and they went like, oops, you are not a mistake. God does not make a mistake. God does not get surprised. It's not like God wakes up and is like, where did they come from? No, he planned you. And because he planned you, he puts you here for a purpose. There's something that only you can do. And if you don't do it, God's mission is not going to be complete. You are that important. Second question. So the first question was, who am I? And the second question is, what do I do? What is it that you're good at? What is it that you're good at? If it's singing, sing. If it's speaking, speak. If it's uh, touching people for for the good of the people. Some people are good at giving hugs. If that's what you do, do it. If it's building something, build it. If it's teaching, teach. If it's cleaning, clean. If it's cooking, cook. Let me stop there for a second. I love I love And there are people who love cooking. Me and those people are a good combination. 
Now we are going to to the whole generation. See, I have the ministry of eating. And they have the ministry of cooking. So now people who love cooking typically don't like eating. But they need people to eat their food. You know how you touch my heart when you cook for me. Yeah, you need to go home for Man, when you cook for me, you, you touch my heart. Yeah, we did it to a while. Some people are really good. Who are the ones who take a walk? I was joking with our friends last night. I used to decide if I don't want to. See, I, I don't spend too long at Pasteur's house. Because both Pasteur and his wife are very good cooks. And I love eating food there. But it can be dangerous. I told you, so no, no, not dangerous. 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 Not exactly in the same sense. <laughs> I may not be able to fit in the, the airplane seat when I go back. <laughs> because, man, that, that. Yeah, we I am about to take a man. Yes. No, uh, <laughs> Some people have a ministry. <laughs> if cooking is your ministry, then do it. <laughs> if it's hospitality. <laughs> If it's making clothes, if it's going out and giving out books, that's not right. But some people are good at it. I have the gift of talking. As a matter of fact, let me finish because you'll be here for two days. That's my gift. So I went into teaching because I get to I get paid to talk. Seriously, I get paid to talk. And I'm good at it. So whatever you're good at, do it. You There's a reason why you're good at it. God gave you that power to be good at it. So first question was, who am I? The second question is, what do I do? The third question is, who do I do it for? Because that will tell you where your ministry it will tell you who your audience is. Now see, I'm really good at talking. But not everybody wants to listen. So there are times when I just am silent. Because they're not listening. If I find a good audience that will listen, I will, I will talk. But if I find a group that doesn't want to listen, there's no need to talk. Okay. So, who am I? What do I do? Who do I do it for? And then this is the important. Before, what do they want? Or what do they need? Because, because if I come here and I give you cake, but you don't want cake, or you don't need cake, it will be useless. If I come here, and you have so much pain, and I spend all the time talking, you're not going to want it. Because I have to first find out what you need, and what you want. Now, if Pasteur is going to cook for me, but I already ate, it's a waste. No, 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 no,
trying to minister to doesn't need it or want it. That's why it's important to find out what your audience is. Now, the, one, the last question is how are they changed because of what I have done? No, it's not enough to do something for somebody. It's important that their lives are changed. For the better. So if you can answer those five questions, and they're not my questions, I, I heard them from a TED talk. When you can answer, who am I? What do I do? Who do I do it for? What do they want or need? And how are they changed? Then, then you can fulfill your vision. Jesus understood who he was. He understood who he was. He understood what he was good at. He understood his privilege. He understood his mission. When we understand our mission, and we could be like the final part of the story, the
Bless all that he deserves, Lord Father. Amen. And grant him peace in his heart, Lord Father. Amen. In this race, oh Father, that he will not wait for by the wayside. Heavenly Lord, pray for each member of this church. Lord, continue to keep us strong. Amen. Father, continue to abide with us. And let your peace continue to be upon our hearts. Amen. Dear Lord, day by day, we meet new challenges. Grant us strength. Amen. Grant us wisdom. Grant us grace to overcome all these challenges, Lord. So that our Lord will live to glorify you forever. And this little group, Lord, you have said that we should not be afraid because it's your desire to make us laugh. Yes. And so, Lord, we believe that soon, very soon, we will grow by numbers. Amen. Lord, and your name will be glorified. Yes. And when we grow, Lord, we will not lose sight of your presence. Yes. Yeah, Lord, we pray for your son also and God will be traveling to Kenya. Daddy, please go with them. Amen. Whether we go to school there, Lord, I pray you will still with her. Amen. You will be by her son. You will give her wisdom and she will exert the struggles. Amen. When that will be coming back, Lord, you will grant him joy and mercy to us. Watch over those who will be open. here while he is gone from your other world, from your other world. And Lord, that by your grace, all of us will continue to keep track of you. Amen. Father, thank you for those who are celebrating today. Yes. Thank you for the believers of God. Bless the mother, bless the daughter. Yes. Keep them strong, oh Father. Yes. That they will celebrate many more happy, Amen. wonderful years Amen. in your presence, Amen. in your glory. Amen. Father, that Lord, they will live to glorify Amen. you. Every act of sadness will take away from their lives. Lord, you will give them strength, oh Father. And for those who are celebrating seven years of being together, yes. Lord, especially in this country where marriage means nothing. But dear Lord, we thank you Amen. for keeping them strong. Amen. Thank you, Lord, for abiding with them. Yes. Thank you, Father, for giving them the grace to know you. Yes. Thank you, Lord, for the gift you have put in you all. Thank you for the joy you have Thank you for Fidel. Yes. Thank you for keeping him strong. Yes. We pray the Lord that you will make this happen in our lives too. Yes. That Lord, grant us grace Amen. to celebrate many more happy years. Yes. Lord, we pray for marriages that are in shambles. Lord, step into such places. Let peace reign supreme, Father. Destroy the works of the enemy in such a way. And let your peace abide. Thank you, Father, for some prayer.